The best and probably only universally applicable writing advice I've ever heard was from this short little lesson taught by Matt Stone and Trey Parker, the South Park guys, at NYU. We found out this really simple rule that maybe you guys have all heard before, but it took us a long time to learn it. But we can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline, and if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f***ed, basically. You got, you got something pretty boring. What should happen between every beat that you've written down is either the word therefore or but. This is why some movies seem like just a series of events that could happen in any order, as opposed to an actual story. It's what makes short movies seem long, and long movies seem... If you're wondering what all of this has to do with Aladdin, just... Hang on a second! To illustrate what I mean, consider the opening sequences of The Empire Strikes Back versus Return of the Jedi. In Empire, Darth Vader sends probe droids to look for Luke Skywalker. One of them crashes on Hoth, prompting Luke to investigate. But he's alone, and so he gets attacked by a wampa. And so he doesn't show up at Hoth base. Well, Princess Leia is wondering about Master Luke. He hasn't come back yet. She doesn't know where he is. I don't know where he is. Nobody knows where he is. What do you mean nobody knows? Well, uh, you said- Deck officer! And therefore, Han goes looking for him. Your Tauntaun will freeze before you reach the first marker. Then I'll see you in hell. Yeah. And so on and so forth. The beginning of Jedi, on the other hand, is just 23 minutes of people arriving. This is just one reason why Jedi is the weakest entry in the original trilogy. Yeah, I like those little furry things. The Ewoks, they blow. Now at this point, you're probably wondering why Aladdin is the thumbnail for this video. It's because upon re-watching it recently, I realized that the opening of Aladdin completely violates the Parker Stone rule and contradicts everything I just said. The movie starts with a traveling salesman slash narrator. I think then you would be most rewarded to consider this. And then... Jafar coerces a small-time crook into the Cave of Wonders. What are you waiting for? Go on! And then this happens... Aladdin keeps one, one jump ahead, ahead of the lawman. That's all, and that's no joke. Then this happens... And Jasmine laments her gilded cage. I hate being forced into this. The prologue obviously has to go first, but the other three scenes could go in basically any order. You could start with Aladdin, since he's the main character, and then go to the palace and later reveal that Jafar is up to no good, for example. And yet, it doesn't feel like they're arranged arbitrarily. It feels like each scene runs into the next. Why is that? The answer is in how the end of one scene connects visually or audibly, but not narratively, to the beginning of the next scene. It's a technique David Boardwell calls the hook, which is a terrible name for it because hook already means something in screenwriting. It's that little twist at the beginning of your story that distinguishes it from the million other screenplays that are floating around Hollywood. You had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. You might be inclined to call these transitions, but that is also already a term of art in screenwriting. It's that screenplay element here that indicates to the editor whether they should dip to black or crossfade or whatever between scenes. So instead, I'm going to call these non-narrative interscenic tethers, or ninists, which is a term so awful I'm hoping it will encourage someone in the comments to come up with something better, but that's what I'm going with for this video. The concept is pretty straightforward. The sound or image at the end of one scene, sometimes a combination of both, connects to the sound or image or both at the start of the next scene. Thus, there are four basic kinds of nists, visual to visual, audio to audio, audio to visual, and visual to audio. The first type, visual to visual, is often what's called a match cut, two shots that are similar to each other in composition or content. It is recognized that you have a funny sense of fun. But a visual-to-visual -visual transition isn't limited to just match cuts. For example, you can play with the norms of continuity editing. In Back to the Future, when Doc Brown looks off into the sky, we expect the next shot to be his point of view. The shot seems to match our expectations until the helicopter appears, and then we realize the story has transitioned from 1955 to 1985. 
Or you can even embed a scene within a scene. Even the opening scene, there's always some random girl who gets a call that undoubtedly ends up getting her killed. It's all so predictable. There's no element of surprise. You can see everything coming. <laughs> ah! Now shut the fuck up and watch the movie. I love it. I've seen it five times and it still gets me every time. An audio to audio tether usually consists of a question and an answer. Do they know something we don't? They're led by a woman. What does a woman know? That's the statue of Anubis. Its legs go deep underground. According to Pembridge scholars, that's where we'll find a secret compartment containing the Golden Book of Amun-Ra. As an added bonus, you get some exposition out and stick it to the patriarchy at the same time. It can also be used to conflate several conversations into one for efficiency or comedic effect. I really shouldn't say anything. I mean, unless you can guarantee me total immunity. And I mean from everything. Including anything you find on my computer. Or in my crawl space. The show Archer regularly plays dialogue across several scenes. Excuse me? I said Miss Archer had an affair with the head of the KGB for like 30 years. <laughs> yeah, until he got blown up. Which was actually my fault. Because she was busy having choke sex with a murderous cyborg who then became the new head of the KGB. Until I built a sexier one out of illegal Soviet parts and a corpse. There was no shortage of dead bodies around ISIS. One of which belonged to the Prime Minister of goddamn Italy. Oh. A sound to picture nudist is also often an answer to a question, with the response coming in a visual rather than verbal form. Where's 007? The most famous use of an audio to visual transition is probably the Gilligan cut, where a character asks a question sarcastically, and then we immediately see that exact thing. What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? It can also be used to eliminate exposition when there's no time to explain. Something's happened! No time to explain! No, children, no! Are you sure it wouldn't be faster to just tell us what happened? No! I said there's no time to explain and I stick by that! The lemon tree's gone! At the risk of dissecting a frog, the reason that joke works is because the audience is used to having the middle part removed. Everybody come quick! Something's happened! No time to explain! No, children, no! The lemon tree's gone! Lastly, there's the picture-to-sound nanist, which seems to be the most rare type. Take Groundhog Day, where Phil is trying to test whether or not the day is truly resetting. It's not the visual, the shot of the clock, that tells us if his test is working. It's... It can also be an answer to an implied question when transitioning back into a frame story. She doesn't get eaten by the eels at this time. To be clear, these are all just examples. There are countless iterations of these non-narrative interscenic transitions, combining different types for various effects. Now, children, do re mi fa so and so on are only the tools we use to build a song. Once you have these notes in your heads, you can sing a million different tunes by mixing them up. Leave your favorite example of a clever nanist in the comments. After the traveling salesman introduces the lamp to us, he tosses sparkles into the air that become stars in the sky. Before we realize we're in a different scene, the camera tilts down to a desert location. It doesn't make logical sense, but it flows, so we go with it. At the end of the brief sequence at the Cave of Wonders, Jafar says, I must find this one, this diamond in the rough. And from there, we cut to Aladdin, who we can all safely assume is the diamond in the rough. Being the title character, Aladdin gets a big song and dance number, as well as some day in the life scene setting, which goes on for about five minutes. Most importantly, the scene sets up his primary goal. Someday, Abu, things are gonna change. We'll be rich, live in a palace, and never have any problems at all. And the next cut immediately contradicts his sentiment. <laughs> as we learn all about Jasmine's dating problems. So, this is why Prince Ahmed stormed out. Oh, father. Raja was just yeah. playing with him, weren't you, Raja? So at this point, we're 16 minutes in, and the only person who's actually tried to do anything to achieve their goals is the villain. And yet, it totally works. There's two great songs, although we don't talk about the first one so much anymore. Place where the caravan camels roam. 
where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. A lot of funny gags and some beautiful animation. The writers and storyboard artists figured out how to carry us through and trick us into following along even though no story has actually happened yet. In fact, the protagonist doesn't actually take an active step for another 10 minutes when he accepts the old man's offer in prison. Make no mistake, this is not a criticism. My point is that clever filmmaking, from writing and performance to animation and editing, is engaging whether you follow the rules or not. It's that law that's the problem. Father? Well, am I Sultan or am I Sultan? From this day forth, the princess shall marry whoever she deems worthy. And sometimes breaking the rules can make for a timeless classic. I choose you, Aladdin. <laughs> Call me Al. <laughs>